So once again, welcome everybody. I'm Anne Lounsbury. I'm an associate of the Jordan Center and chair of the Department of Russian Slavic Studies at NYU. And I am absolutely thrilled to be able to introduce Wendy Salman, who's professor of art and art history at Chapman University. Mm -hmm. Professor Salman is a scholar of Russian and early Soviet art, architecture, and design. She's written and lectured extensively on the arts and crafts movement, on Art Nouveau, and on Russian modernism. To me, um, her work is particularly exciting because she attends so carefully to the 19th century, um, which is not something that that many people in North American art historical visual studies do um, for Russia. Professor Salman has also served as visiting curator at Hillwood Museum and Gardens in Washington, DC, and as guest curator of exhibitions at Hillwood, at Hillwood and at the New York Public Library. She's translated many texts on Russian art and culture um, for which we owe her a great deal. And she's edited volumes on um, various volumes, including on the sculptor um, Sergei Konyakov, is that, if that's, uh, if I have the stress right, the Bolshevik sales of Russian art in the 20s and 30s, and the reception of art and in Russia. Her current project is a book tracing transformations in the perception and functions of icons in Russia, from objects of devotion to works of art. Today's talk, which I believe is drawn from that project, although correct me if I'm wrong, is titled The Faceted Chamber and the Meanings of Restoration in the 19th Century. So welcome, Wendy Salman. Thanks so much, Anne. Um, I can't tell you how what a total pleasure it is to be here today because I feel I'm with all my people. Uh, one of the marvelous things that 19V has done for all of us is bring us together and make us realize what, a, what an amazing community it is. And although I see my immediate friends in the art history um, part of 19V, the whole, if, if the world ended today or something happened to this Zoom, 19th century art history would be lost as far as North America is concerned. This is a, a pretty amazing grouping of people. But even better than that has been the bringing together for us art historians with the literary people and the historians and people working in all different areas to realize how much we have in common. So it's just, I, I am so grateful to this initiative for giving me hope for the future of our field and just moving things forward in a way that I think they never would have done otherwise. So I'm, I'm tremendously grateful. So let me share my screen in the time honored way. People all across America are saying, let me share my screen right now. Okay, so this is my topic. and. Um, as advertised. And I want to start with a, um, a statement of how embarrassed I am to be working on this topic and showing it to you today. I've got a double reason to be embarrassed about it. First, because no one, no art historian in their right mind working in the 19th century wants to do, have anything to do with official, um, official state culture. I mean, this, if, if anything ha is coming out of the state officially mandated, it's the, the story of the faceted chamber in the 19th century. And I have another reason to be embarrassed by it is no one in their right mind who's an art historian today would have anything to do with the aesthetic values that are represented in the faceted chamber as it's come to come down to us today. It is the very epitome, I certainly have always thought, of stodgy academic official wrong thinking attitudes towards the past. And it's the very antithesis of the idea of forward looking progressive avant-garde um, engagements with the past as, as we've come to think about them in the 19th century. So I'm walking into this um, embarrassed, I think, and I hope in a really productive way because it's forcing me to rethink things which I had taken as fixed and sacrosanct in the way I looked at the 19th century. And it's come to me out of, and I'll bring with my first slide here, it's come to me very late in my long um, uh, project on Russian icons and how they came to be perceived in the 19th and early 20th century into the Soviet period actually. And I've only realized when, um, it, it, actually through looking at things like the, the, the Fasted Chamber Restoration Project, how biased and subjective my own view has been. And I've come to realize that the kind of scenario I'm showing you here has completely shaped my attitudes towards looking at icons and looking at the past and looking at how we think about them in relation to the past. So if we think about sort of the Ur icon, as we've come to know it, the Vladimir Mother of God, sort of the first icon to come to Russia, 
in the 12th the, the first one of the first surviving ones. Um, and for most of us, I think maybe for all of us, it looks like this in the middle. It is this, it is this poignant example of, of Byzantine art that's come to Russia and laid the foundations for a millennium of icon painting. Um, and we know it this way because of what happened to it in the early Soviet period. The chart, the schema I'm showing you on the right um, was devised in the um, state central restoration workshops in right after the revolution during the civil war when um, a group of Soviet, uh, Soviet Bolshevik, early, early Soviet restorers decided that it was time to restore Russia's greatest icons back to their um, authentic selves. To, to return them to their origins. And you can see from the schema here just what a difficult project this was and continues to be because the, 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 um, the, the, the um, guide down at the bottom shows you coding how to read the surface or what's underneath the surface really of the Vladimir mother of God that the only 12th century part left to us is the, is the white here. This is, this is all that's left of the original. And as you follow the code out from the center of the face out to the margins, what we're looking at is like an X-ray in a way of what is of the buildup of history and how little of the original moment in that history is actually left. So I think for many of us, we, we maybe know this, but when we're looking at icons, we, we conveniently forget it. We can vet all the difficult decisions that have been made in order to give us this in the center. Uh, how much, if we were to begin thinking about the fact that this is from the 16th century, or this is from the 17th century, or this is in paint from the 19th century, what do we do with that knowledge about the idea of an original icon? So the whole project, there's a certain amount of amnesia or convenient forgetting, I think that goes on in order for us to be able to think about icons in the way we do now. Um, and the great villain in the room, as I'll come to in a minute, is the latest layer, which is really what I'm talking about today. This is what the Vladimir Mother of God would have looked like to people by the, in the middle of the 19th century. So she would have been completely hidden behind her aklad, her riza, um, and layers and layers of paint which had not yet been stripped down. So there's a sense of you know, two worlds here essentially, or two time periods, um, that has everything to do, the way of thinking about these visually and conceptually is we've come to think about them in this way, thanks to the early Soviet attitudes towards icons. And I think for me, that's been really significant. I've spent a lot of time trying to understand how Soviet restoration um, treated the icons that have come down to us. And I'm still grappling with a lot of this baggage because this we're looking at baggage before our very eyes here. Um, so the question really, the, 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 the binary question that Soviet restoration brought up, and it's never gone away, is one towards how, how, we, how we actually think about the act of restoration. Um, is, it, is it raskritia, discovering, revealing, um, liberating from the, la the later layers of the past, or is it vastanavlenia? restoring it to its original self. Those sound as if they're two similar things, but actually in the minds of Soviet scientific restoration, they were diametrically opposed. And here I'm showing you a photo of Igor Grabar, who was sort of the eminence grise and the main um, you know, mastermind behind the invention of, so of Soviet icon restoration at the central state uh, restoration workshop sometime around the early 1920s. Um, putting in place this new uh, rigorous attitude towards how we treat the past. And as you can see from this quote from Graba here, for him, the very word restoration had become a dirty word by the early Soviet period. It stood for everything that had gone wrong in the 19th century. Um, so to insist that there, the new, the new attitude towards icons would be one of revealing what was there and not restoring what might have been there is a profound change. Um, Vastanavlenia came uh, freighted, tainted with the subjectivity of the restorer. You know, how did you know what you were putting back? Um, 
why are you putting that there and not that there? Of course, there's a terrible snake in the garden here that, that Grubar didn't like to talk about. Um, although Soviet Russians and restorers today are very, very aware of this. If you're going to reveal something down to its bones, if you're gonna take it back to its origins, what do you do with the losses? What do you do with what's no longer there? Um, and so there's a very muddy middle ground here that the restoration community is very aware of, how much do you put back? How do you fill in the white voids that have been left there when you've, when you've taken away everything you don't want? So there's a, there's a slippery slope element here in posing it this way, but I think there's this also a strategic element here. Grabar and his friends like Alexander Anisimov, they were super aware that they were, they were arguing for a new, a new age of restoration to replace the corrupt age of restoring icons in the imperial period. So there's very much a sign of, we are, not go we are going to do something new. We're going to learn from the mistakes of the past. Um, and these are the sort of mistakes that they were thinking about. Um, uh, a good century, or at least a good seven decades or so, beginning in the reign of Nicholas I, when what, had, what survived of the icons and the frescoes of early modern medieval Russia were subjected to a process of restoration, which entailed enormous potential danger for what had survived. Um, so beginning in the, already back in the 1820s um, with St. Sophia's Cathedral in Kiev, there was a, a whole series of restoration projects, incredibly enthusiastic, funded often by the state and by the church, which entailed um, stripping away, just stripping away the whitewash and the plaster, which had been put over medieval frescoes in the 18th century because they were so outmoded and so embarrassing, um, discovering what lay um, concealed beneath the 18th century plaster and restoring it to its original condition. So this too is restoration, but rather than, it may start as rescritia, but it turns into vastanavienia. And this becomes the problematic thing for the, for the 20th century that gives us problems today. So this is the sort of attitude of um, those in charge of these big restoration projects, especially the fresco projects. So this is um, Georgiusky Sabor um, in Yuryev Monastery in Novgorod, a 12th century um, structure that in the, up until the 17th century still had a lot of its frescoes intact. Um, so when they discovered in the 1830s that many of these frescoes were still there, um, at first there was a project by the local bishop to um, get rid of them. So there was a big demolition project. Then there was a restoration project. Um, and what survived of these incredibly precious frescoes like this, by the end of the century got repainted by the Safonov um, artel of icon painters. So. What's interesting here is the mentality of those in charge at this moment. This is, a, this is a really 19th century mentality, but it's also built on, premised on centuries of belief that everything builds on what was there before. There's, a, there's an ongoing, unbroken, sequential um, life of the frescoes and the icons that we have, and it's our duty to build on them when they get too difficult to, to see or they become too decrepit for, um, for common use, it's our job to restore them. So the idea that when they've not survived, it's okay to paint in something in the same style. This is the, th the mentality for us to think about. Um, and also this feeling that the modern painter, those in charge of restoring in the 19th century are superior actually, they can do better than what was there before. So the superior taste of the 19th century person in charge of these restorations can actually make a seamless transition into the renewal of what was there before and somehow leave us with something even better than was there before. So it's, a, it's this kind of thinking, I think that's very alien to us. It's, it's very difficult, I think, to, to forgive some of, these <laughs> some of these projects for what they did to, um, the, the many, many of the oldest medieval 
fresco cycles that have remained and to think about this as a continuity and not as a vandalism. Um, it's, a, it's a bitter swill to, pill to, to swallow to change the way we might think about this. I'm not at all recommending we do think about it differently, but I am thinking how strange it is to be in a world that sees this as a good thing um, and as a, as a laudable thing. How do we get around that? Um, so now I turn to my faceted chamber, which is entirely new terrain for me. I really didn't know anything about it until about a month ago. And I had to really hustle to <laughs> bring myself up to scratch to understand what this was about. And I think I know now that I chose it because I knew how little I knew about it. And I knew it was one of the most problematic examples of 19th century attitudes towards restoration. So I, I felt I owed it to myself to try and understand what was going on there. And I thought it would be nice to start with this um, image by Apollinari Vasnetsov of the site of where we're looking from 1897. So the end of 19V, where 19V is disappearing over the horizon. And here we have a potentially rather modern thinking artist who's looking back to the beginnings. He's imagining, I mean, in his imagination, he's restoring how it must have been when the Kremlin complex was being built. Um, in a way, I'm thinking about this as like a, a version of the Vladimir Mother of God, sort of without all the messy complications of what happened next. So if we were imagined we were sitting there high up on, um, on the scaffolding here, looking down on Cathedral Square, we would see the Kremlin as it was meant to be, as it first was. This is, this is Vasnetsov's conceit. Um, so here, this, is, this must be 1508, because here's the Archangel Cathedral in the process of being built. Um, on the right, the first of the cathedrals, Dormition, 1479. On the left, Annunciation, 1489. And in the front, this is what we need to, this is where I'm, I'm trying to find my feet here. The, the big palace complex that Ivan III is having built for himself. Um, so it's a, it's a secular and a, and a sacred space combined. And here we see the buildings that the faceted chamber is at the center of. The Kremp, the Terim Palace here, still a wooden structure. Um, the faceted chamber, the, the middle golden chamber, and here just tucked away in the corner, the golden Tsarina's chamber. Um, so together, this was the, the palace complex of Ivan III. And I suppose this is supposed to be him standing up here giving orders for the... Um, so this is, this is sort of a charming, uncomplicated and sort of delightfully naive view of the site that we're looking at. But of course we know, um, no matter where we come from, I think we can know that this is, this is as oversimplified, that the story of, the, of this site is as complicated as the story of the Vladimir Mother of God. Um, so for example, I take us back in history, that was, that was supposed to be 1508. So if we come forward to 16, 1613, we know that in between that moment, the building of the, building of the Kremlin center and this moment when um, Tsar Mikhail uh, Romanov is in the middle of his coronation and he's, here he is in the same site again, the fire of 1547 has happened. And much of this must have been, if not swept away, gutted. So we're looking at the reconstruction of the shell of something which is already a hundred and something years old, but it's appearing before us in this manuscript from 1613 as if nothing has changed. So there's a sense of sort of imaginative re rebuilding. Things have changed, things have been repainted, roofs have been switched, um, things which have been, been destroyed have been rebuilt, but the, the conceit of continuity is very strongly there. So if I bring us forward into the early 19B, our, our own field, the 18th century has devastatingly intervened in the middle here. And by the time we get to the reign of Nicholas I, the 18th century has happened, and with it a pretty devastating set of events for this same site. So for example, I don't know if you can see here, but the, the middle golden chamber is gone, um, swept away in the reign of, um, I think, Elizabeth who was wanting to make a nice summer uh, palace for herself there. And this whole piece in the middle here is gone um, in the interests of, an, of a later Tsarina. The golden uh, Tsaritsa's cha chamber is still there, um, but it's not easy to see here, but there's also been considerable construction work done on the building itself. All of the window surrounds 
of the exterior of the faceted chamber have been, um, the shapes of the windows have been changed, they've been enlarged, and they've been given Baroque frameworks. So what at first seems to be an enduring consistent image is actually undergone consistent ongoing um, changes, updates, modifications. But the, the idea endures, certainly the block is there. If we come forward to the middle of the 19th century, another humongous change has happened. So Nicholas wanting to celebrate the Kremlin as the heartland of his um, tripartite, tripartite ideas of autocracy, orthodoxy and nationality has built the great Kremlin palace. And this is so, this is now gone to be taken by the great Kremlin palace and the faceted chamber has actually been incorporated into that building. So now you enter the faceted chamber through the different, through the halls of the great Kremlin palace. So it's, in other words, it's constantly undergoing adaptation and modification. It never stands still as an exterior. Now, if we come to the interior, even more difficult. It, it has taken me a, a lot of, a lot of um, um, searching to try and understand what happened to the interior, the place that we're actually interested in, the faceted chamber itself, which we see here as it was in 1613 for the coronation of um, the first Romanov Tsar. Um, I don't know why it was so difficult to find out that there were actually these three golden chambers. Um, I, <laughs> but it turns out they were. So if we follow the, this is the, the central, the middle and the Tsaritsa's chamber, each, each was a throne room essentially. So these were um, three important secular states, um, sites for the celebration and enforcement of the power of the, of the Tsar. Um, each of them was to be a site for the reception of foreign dignitaries, um, for the passing of laws or causes for, for exceptional important events of state. Um, and so each, the decoration of each became of central importance to the role of these spaces. Uh, so we know that probably, at least we think we know, this is all very hazy in my mind, probably in the reign of Ivan III, these, the chambers of the, the, the central chamber, the, the middle chamber and the faceted chamber were probably decorated with an iconographic program that celebrated the dynasty of the Ruriks, the Ivan's dynastic lineage and his divine right to rule. The fire of 1547 happens um, uh, and by the reign of um, uh, um, um, Fyodor Ioannovich, he apparently completely restores the lost frescoes that were there. And it seems as if he repaints them pretty much as they had been under Ivan III, because they're dynastic. They're an important restatement of the same right to rule that his grandfather had. And so apparently they were pretty much the same as is recorded here in this diagram from the 1970s. And presumably the faceted chamber had a similar um, figural program full of, I mean, this is, this, uh, the diagram I'm showing you here, we know, we know in, at least in, in North American circles, this is, this is the work that Michael Flyer has done to help us understand the deep political significance of frescoes in this world, that they were a background of full of dynastic and state messages of power. Um, but the fact that Michael's work has pretty much done from this reconstructed diagram suggests how tricky the whole story is, because this no longer existed in, um, um, by the middle of the 18th century. So the only building that did exist still, um, the, only, the only chamber was the faceted chamber. Um, but by the late 17th, 17th century, by the 1660s, the frescoes that had been put up by Tsar um, Fyodor were in a state of such dilapidation that Tsar Alexei um, passed an ukaz requiring that they be repainted or updated or restored, in other words. So the man he asked to restore them was his chief icon painter, Simon Ushakov. Um, Ushakov hummed and hard and said, I haven't got time. This is not a good time to do it. So it's, there is some controversy about this, but it seems pretty clear that Ushakov did not in the end 
repaint the, the cycle a third time for the Fester Chamber. Um, what he did do was compile a, a complete detailed description of the program, of the iconographic program. And this went into the archives um, where it remained until the 19th century. So we come to um, the late 1670s, um, the chamber is still in pretty, pretty terrible condition. There must have been frescoes there, but they were in bad shape. Now we come to Peter's time, 1696. They're really looking awful. And he passes an ukaz saying that they're going to, they need to be destroyed. And they become, because they're, they're an embarrassment to the state. They, ju they just look awful. And they are whitewashed over. Um, and then uh, in the next reign, and I come here, we come to coming close to the center. This is the fasted chamber as we enter um, the 18th century. And this actually is how it must have looked in the reign of Paul. So for a whole century here, they are whitewashed, all of the vaults. And in Paul's time, he gussies them up a little bit by putting in this yummy red velvet with little gold and silver double-headed eagles over them, much more in keeping with a refined European kind of monarchy. So there's a sense that the old days are behind us. We don't need that. That was then, this is now. Um, and for the rest of the, the next two, for, until the middle of the 19th century, from Catherine's coronation to Alexander II's coronation, they take place against the blank white vault of the faceted chamber. So it's not a place that we sort of would be familiar with now, but this is what we're looking at. Um, sort of continuity here about something is there in the past, but it's disappeared. We're not gonna get it back again. So this brings us now to the reign of Nicholas, where we started, the man who's made the great Kremlin palace. And he's a man with a mission to restore the grandeur of his predecessors. This is a czar that very much wants to reconnect with those pre-Petrine Tsars, and if possible, even the pre-Romanov Tsars. There is, a, there is a dynastic yearning for connection here, which I think is really interesting. And he starts, I, th I think we could say this is a start, this is a start of restoration, um, a first experiment really. Um, I, I showed you the Tirim Palace, which is tucked at the back of the, of the faceted chamber, that complex. By the late 18th century, the Tirim Palace too was in pretty poor shape. It was falling apart, it was gutted. The Napoleonic invasion, the, the interior was just in terrible state after that. And one of Nicholas's initiatives was to um, ensure the total renovation of the Tirim Palace to his former glory. And he um, commissioned this man here at the top right, Fyodor Sonsev, to do this work for him. Sonsev was a, a unique phenomenon in the early 19th century, he was given the special new title, artist archeologist. He, was an, he had the title academician, but he was like a special kind of academician. He, he had carved out a niche for himself as an, as an authority on the pre-Petrine past. Um, he was a great recorder of all of the legacy, the historic um, patrimony of the pre-Petrine past. And so Nicholas entrusted him with entirely restoring the lost interiors of the Tyrian Palace. So this was a gutted space also. It was a tabula rasa. Um, uh, Sonsev took all of his records and his archives and bits and pieces of things that he knew about that past. And he totally repainted, imagined, reimagined what he thought the Tyrian Palace must have been like in the royal apartments. Um, he painted all of these, um, a lot of this appears to have been done by his own hand. So he took these ornamental um, um, motifs and painted them into the vaulting. He took images of saints, patron saints of the family um, and tucked these in here too. I don't think he had any justification for thinking that they were there. But in other words, he created a background that had been missing for what it must have felt like to be in a secular pre-Petrine space. And you can see from this wonderful illustration from somewhere in the 1850s or 60s maybe, that people are now coming out in awe and wonder to find themselves in this reconstituted past, which had been taken from them. There was no space like this available. Um, and it's a particular interest of mine is becoming the, the, the emergence of history painting in this period, 
and history painters owed an enormous amount to the, the, to the way that Sonsov had provided them with backdrops for their historical dramas. You can't imagine all of those paintings by Schwarz and Lebedev and Makovsky and um, uh, taking place against white walls. It just isn't gonna work. So this lush, ornamental, colorful, exotic medieval past becomes the imaginative backdrop for how 19th century people are coming to be, to think about their own history. It's, it's actually like, it's like a stage set that's being created. Um, so this is the 1830s um, this, and Nicholas, the same thing happens with his son. So Nicholas dies in 1856, Alexander comes to the throne. And one of the first things he does, his first executive order almost, is to order that the birthplace, the home estate of the Romanov dynasty be turned into a museum, a dynastic museum. So this is the palace of the Romanov, um, the Romanov family. I think in the Soviet period, it was turned into a um, museum of museum of boyars. But but for Alexander, this was the this was the home of the birthright. Uh, it was again, it was a derelict building. It had had fires. It had been. It had. It had it was in terrible shape. And the architect Fyodor Richter was entrusted with a total restoration, taking it down to the studs and seeing if he could build it up as it had been in its original state. Um, it had been through fires, all kinds of things. So here's Richter at the bottom here, a, a pretty much forgotten 19th century architect. But now people generally think he's probably the first, he's the, he's the precursor of an idea of scientific restoration in the way he went about the project. Um, so the, the most controversial part of this was how to reconstruct, how to restore the chambers, the interiors. And the outside you can do things. He had to completely rebuild the interiors and he made an executive decision with advice from the czar that some of the spaces would be painted. Um, this was sort of tricky because they had, he had found no trace of painting whatsoever in the, in the interior spaces. But um, Alexander very much wanted to have a more elaborate interior. So this is the dining room that Richter um, had constructed as it is today, actually. And he did marvelous things like, look at, look at how inventive this is. He took the decorative motifs from the grammata for that, that records the, um, the election of the first Roman of Tsar, and he takes some of these motifs and he moves them into the ceiling. And then he puts things like the coat of arms of the Romanov family and the monogram of Mikhail Fyodorovich. So the whole thing becomes like a, an evocation of a lost past brought back to the present. And again, I just, the second example of something that is happening against a void. It has been entirely lost and it's up to these restorers to, re, to, to give it back to us. Otherwise we have no connection with our past, no visual connection with that past. Um, now, finally, I come to um, uh, our faceted chamber. This is what it looked like around the reign of, I'm sorry about the watermark, I couldn't get another, a better image of it. Um, how, how bare, how dusty, how deserted, how uninspiring it really looked. <laughs> it's a, and, and given the success of the Tirin Palace interior, the, the Romanov Palace in interior, this is clearly, um, a site ripe for, uh, for restoration. So we come now to the reign of Alexander III. Um, he's about to be, um, he comes to the throne in 1881. The coronation is gonna take place in 1883. And this has got to be a dream project for the third in line to, with these, these secular spaces from the, from the past, these are walls which are, which are dying to be repainted, dying to be restored. And Alexander passes in a cars. Again, it's interesting that these require, you know, these are state matters, so they're, they're legally binding. Um, and, he, and he asked this man on the right here, Georgi Filimonov, to take care of the project. So he, he tells Filimonov, take the interior of this and for my coronation, ensure that the original um, 16th, 17th century frescoes are put back are restored in time for the coronation. There's something fairy tale like about this whole story, I must say. Now, Filimonov is the perfect man for the job. 
he is a again a totally underrated figure incredibly important for as a gatekeeper of knowledge as a recoverer of knowledge which had been just lost um, he was the assistant and then the chief curator at the armory um, in this period he was the mover and shaker behind one of the most vigorous um, antiquarian organizations of the 1870s and 80s, the Moscow Public Museum, the Society of Early Russian Art. Um, and through these venues, he just poured um, knowledge back into, into the public domain. He was, the, if you look at the Vesniki of, of this organization, it is just packed with information which had been lost, which is coming out of the archives, coming out of collections and storage, coming out of the armory in the Kremlin palaces. Um, just an extraordinary person. So there's another reason why Filimonov was perfect here, because he was a great authority on Simon Ushakov. In fact, he was the only authority on Simon Ushakov. Um, in 1873, he wrote a hundred pages, the first history of this artist, of the, the last of the great medieval icon painters, one might say. And it was Filimonov's contention that Ushakov was a key figure between the old world and the present because he was the icon painter who was able to merge tradition, Byzantine tradition and modernity. And Ushakov with his, um, his sort of sophistication, his awareness of modern Greek icons, um, his living in the post Nikonian period he was able to sort of harness the stylistic evolution of the 17th century with its chiaroscura and its softening and its humanizing to the, um, the iconographic traditions of the past. And for Filimonov, this was, this was a golden opportunity to hold this. Not just that, that Ushakov had written down the description of those lost, um, those lost fresco, fresco program, but that in, if, we could, if we could reconnect with the style of Ushakov before all that was swept away under the Petrine reforms, we might actually reconnect in a living way with that lost culture. So there's an appeal here to not just slavishly recopy what was lost in an, in an antiquarian way, but to sort of see it as the beginning of a new wave of icon painting. Um, and this was at this mo this was incredibly important and and fraught in the late 1870s because this was when um, a small shockwave was caused by the publication of Eugène Violet Le Duc's La Rousse. Um, this was a this was a, a Frenchman writing to Russians, telling them what was important about their art, and his conclusions. I won't go into it now, but um, there was a lot of a lot of heartache about. What he, who he thought he was. <laughs> who do you think you are telling us about our work? But Filimonov um, took a, he was, he was enthralled by this moment because he said, here are Westerners telling us, appreciate what you've got. Look to, and especially for him, look to your popular art, look to your narodness, look to what survives and is alive today in your artistic heritage and build on it because you've got something we haven't got. We in the West have given up all of our, our, um, our faith. It went out with the Middle Ages. And here we are lost in this sort of secular no man's land of, of, of the neoclassical present and the secular present. So finally, the Europeans are looking, the West are looking to us as, the, um, um, as having inherited this great rich past and we have a chance to make it live again. Um, this is what I think, I mean, I think it's, it's pretty clear. This is what he was doing when he was, when he was charged with the project of repainting the, the, the faceted chamber. So what does he do now? He goes looking for someone to do the job. And this is the fatal moment here. Instead of going up to St. Petersburg in the academy and finding a well-trained academic painter, or going to the Moscow School of Painting, Architecture and Sculpture and finding a good realist artist. He goes to Palyuk, to the traditional center of icon painting, the place that had produced, and this actually the Safonovs, the Peshikhonovs, the Sapozhnikovs, these icon painting bands that had done the restorations of all these medieval churches. He goes to Palyuk and he contracts 
the Biela Usuf workshop to do the job of repainting the fasted chamber. And this is a, for, for Filimonov, this is a really important moment because what he's doing is taking the people who are the, have inherited the, tra the tradition of icons, it's never gone away. They have moved, they have moved around as things change and fluctuate, but they remain true to the tradition. So today, this, this icon here, I think, is a pretty rough, I find this a hard thing to handle. This, this is an example of Biela Usuf icon painting from maybe the 1860s. Here's their, their stamp on the back. It's a printed, a printed paper version. And it's got all the qualities of what that we might think are compromise. You know, he's they're having their cake and eating it too. It's, it's, it's iconographically correct, but it's taking on some of these academic qualities demanded by the elite. You know, so they're trying to go with the flow of a changing audience. Um, and this is something that, that Filimonov saw as a positive thing. You know, it hasn't died, it continues to live. It continues to adapt, it's a living thing. Um, and one of the reasons, this was, this was sort of the core argument, and I think it's a really compelling one. It's made me think a lot about my own prejudices of thinking about this period. Uh, Filimonov had by chance been able to buy up a vast collection of prorisi. And these were the paper um, cartoons that every icon painter had in their workshop by the, middle, by the 19th century. These were tracings that they'd taken of old icons that were like a pattern bank. And this is how they knew, this is how they had collections of iconographic um, variants. Um, and you can see that they, these are working drawings and they use them to produce new icons for new customers. So this, this image, this is a, a Paliak icon from maybe the first half of the 19th century. And stylistically, it's not like the Biela Ulsef icons, but you can see the connection in Philomonas' mind is that the, they live, the icons live on because they're rooted into an undying source of inspiration. And as long as these, um, Ushakov lives through these prodesi too. So there's a sense of, of life going on. Um, so now, finally, the deed is done. We come to coronation day in 1883 and the blank walls are gone and the past has been miraculously re renewed. And I think this is, I've, I've, I had seen this, this painting thinking about Makovsky in another context, but now I look at it and think, boy, you could probably still smell the paint in here. The strange discrepancy between this ancient aura of the past and knowing that they'd just been painted is really kind of um, discombobulating and, uh, but the whole thing is about facade, right? The past has, has magically appeared again and we have restored our link to the past. This is the coronation banquet that takes place in the Fasted Chamber. Um, and of course, the whole moment, the whole coronation is steeped in this idea of reconnection. So I put that if, if we step back a little bit and look at more familiar things um, created to celebrate the coronation, we have these famous... Um, menus designed by Viktor Vasnetsov, Apollinari's brother. These are, these are now very famous collectibles. It, presumably every guest at the coronation banquet got one of these. This one's in French. Um, so, um, but the idea is clear, restoring the grandeur of our lost ancestral past. Fabergé and company, um, uh, commissioned by the court to make uh, a facsimile a pretty, clear, a pretty pretty good facsimile of the chaka, the personal chaka of the first Roman of Tsar. So another example of bringing back, of, of replacing what was there. And the Biela Ulsef brothers, sort of in, in gratitude for um, the great opportunity they've been given, they present an icon of, of um, the King of Kings to the Tsar. And it hangs in the faceted chamber behind the throne. So kind of, and this, I, I'm sort of surprised looking at these things together because somehow for the first time, it's filled a gap in my own way of thinking that these belong together on some level. Vasnetsov, Fabergé and Biela Usufs, if you cut across horizontally, they're all conceptually aligned with each other. Um, and generally speaking, Paliak is in a place by itself to the side. It doesn't mix in this kind of company. 
but I think this is a moment where they, these are part of the same soil. They're coming out of the same motivations. Um, so if, if from the Tsar's point of view, the, a great success. Here we, um, here's a painting by Zichi of the, another view of the coronation banquet. Here's the throne over here. Um, and you can imagine the satisfaction that the Tsar got. Here he's writing to his, to, um, his wife, Maria Fyodorovna, about what a deeply satisfying event it was to look around him on this great day. And this idea that this is a way to reassert the fact that, that Europe is, is um, morally corrupt. It's lost its faith, it's lost its anchor, but we remain true to our sacred Orthodox past. And we're, um, we're showing, and, and both to our Orthodoxy and to our lineage that takes us right back to Ivan III. Even though, of course, the Romanists had nothing to do with that lineage, but it's a way of linking yourself back to the beginnings. Um, so as the visitors sitting here at their marvelous banquet look up, they're to be reminded of this in the sea of gold. It's a, it's a powerful statement of a return to origins, better and stronger than ever. Um, so on the walls, you would look up and this is the edifying <laughs> um, scenes that the viewers would look at. Um, a parable of the just and the unjust judges that would remind the czar to be a just ruler. Um, but now in this, I mean, just amazing to look at it now, this amazing combination. All, this is all reproducing Ushakov's description, presumably. So iconographically, it's absolutely correct. Stylistically, it, it's just really odd. I don't, maybe we can talk about this in the discussion, what it actually means to look at the, the re restoration of the past in this guise. Um, the language is extraordinary. Uh, the dynastic elements, again, here's the um, uh, Prince Vladimir and his 12 sons, the very sort of beginning of the race, that, that how palpable for Alexander III, the need to link himself back to this, this, this idea of the roots of his right to, to be a holy czar, I think as all of this imagery is surrounding people um, as they sit and eat at the banquet. Uh, and finally, this is a bit of a hodgepodge of an image, but um, uh, if we go back to the, to the reign of Fyodor, uh, when the, the second variation of these, the, sec the second iteration of the frescoes uh, appears to have originated, then another way of thinking about this, and I feel quite tentative here because I don't know that I believe it, but is it possible to look at the Biela Usus restoration for the third time of these frescoes, um, to look at it not as a terrible misstep, um, but as an authentic expression of the ways in which people in the 19th century tried to grapple with a past that they actually couldn't understand because a century and a half lay between them and it. So are we looking at something like Pugin's Gothic Revival. I mean, there's often there's, a, there's an analogy made with this here, that this is, this is the, the, the Middle Ages seen through 19th century eyes and it can't be disguised. So, I mean, this, here's a pasuna of um, Tsar Fyodor, just to, just to remind us of how style rem doesn't, um, you know, it, it, it changes. You can't, to imagine that those, the Biela Usov brothers would have tried to make it look like a, 15th or 16th or 17th century icon defies belief really. How could that be? It just, it's, it's implausible. Okay, so I'm in my last two slides here. Uh, and this again, I think is something that we can, that will come up in discussion, but um, in all the reading I tried to cram in the last month or so to find out as much as I could about what we think about the faceted chamber, there's a remarkable lack of conversation. There's a reticence to weigh in on it. I think we now, as we think about it, go tut, tut, tut. Oh my God, I can't believe that. <laughs> Is that real? But in the literature, there's a real resistance to taking a stand on it. And this is as close, I think, as I've ever seen. This is the, this is the coffee table tourist book that was published in 1978 to celebrate um, the faceted chamber and, and make it part of the tourist circuit of, of, of the Soviet era. 
Um, so this is Aida Nasibova who wrote this really, really lovely book. She's got wonderful text in it, but her conclusion about the restoration, this is as much as she's going to say. Well, they're probably the best that could do the job back then. <laughs> really no one else was gonna be able to do it. And they did a pretty good job, but really it's not that great. And it's just a bad, another example of bad 19th century restoration. So she doesn't quite say that, but essentially that's the gist of it. And there you have it. What are you gonna do? Um, we're stuck with it, essentially. So the, in, the, in the 20th century, the faceted chamber, it was restored after the war. It was restored in the late 60s. And then the most amazing thing, it got a total comprehensive makeover in 2011, 12. And this is, if you want to get see an amazing piece of, of PR, there's this amazing 20 minute video of the restoration project, Balt Stroy. I mean, this is, a, this is a big Kremlin funded thing. It's, I don't know how much it cost, it was enormous. So they, they took the whole thing down to its, to cracks and all, the whole thing, with, the whole fresco was in terrible repair and they brought it back to a gleaming example of its original self. But here's this wonderful paradox, which I'll, which I'll sort of end with here. Um, in bringing it back to its splendor, the whole tone of the restoration was that they're bringing back to its authentic 19th century self. And they didn't even remember that it was a 19th century restoration and not an 18th century restoration. So already now in the 21st century, we're playing fast and loose with the actual facts of the, the faceted chamber's history. It's as if what happened to it before it was whitewashed in, seven, in, in 1696 did, never happened. What's really happening in the collective memory of now is to accept the Biela Usus frescoes as the real thing and to elide that surface into the surfaces of the past so that it makes like a composite memory and we don't really need to think about these messy layers that are underneath there. If we make a complete um, um, cleaning of the surface, then all of the baggage of history can somehow be contained. And I think this is, a, this is an interesting episode to think about in terms of restoration as it's being perceived now. Um, this is my final slide. Um, the, this, this is the faceted chamber today in all its glory, um, beautifully restored floor, the furniture was restored to the um, facsimile furniture that was made in the 1880s. It's a, it's a, it's a strange phenomenon as something that feels as if it's always been there and yet it was made just yesterday. And it brings into question lots of ideas about um, this, this, our subjectivity with the way we think about the past and just how complicated I think the whole idea of restoration is. I'll stop there and I'll stop sharing. Thank you. Wendy, thank you so much for that absolutely fascinating and in many ways disturbing talk. And <laughs> Good. <laughs> the most positive way, um, haunting actually, to learn about um, the history of these paintings. So I have many questions, but I think that um, before I ask them, I, I will open the floor and um, Sasha Spadagnik will be moderating the discussion through chat. Um, I'm sure that, that many, oh, I'm, uh, I'm sure that, that many of you have questions. So um, please. Feel free to start the discussion. Sasha. So uh, looks like Lida Varonina, if you'd like to ask your question, I can unmute you. Okay. Um, it seems to me that uh, the uh, the purpose of restoration dependent on the the task uh, the original is supposed to play or to how it is supposed to function in the present. The, the revealing of the past, it would be interesting in the, in the authentic state, would be interesting for the historian. Or the beauty of the past would be interesting for, uh, for the artist or for the museum curator. But the uh, 
um, um, the re redoing it, um, the restoration, восстановление rather than um, открытие, uh, is going is, is would be the best uh, for the church, for the priests, for the religious purposes, because the experience which is the viewer supposed to get from uh, looking at the painting of, or, on the or from or, or on the icon um, uh, is different. So uh, the the just little pieces of the past wouldn't function the way the um, um, re the uh, the religion requires to function it wouldn't be gazing or meditative experience or revering experience it's just like aesthetic experience is something totally different than mm -hmm. religious experience so and that in this sense that even even um uh, uh, the restoration of the Granavita Palata. <laughs> so it it's uh, uh, it depends on the purpose of the ruler, where or what justifies uh, his power or her power, mm -hmm. the past or the future. You know that's uh, uh, and it's uh, it's just it's 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 actually very relative. That's that's my point. Uh, and absolutely right, Lita. Um, and I think the relativity and subjectivity is the whole, for me, my whole humbling takeaway here. Um, because uh, all of those restorations are completely appropriate and necessary if you think about their original function. I mean, functioning within that culture, they absolutely must be restored to their former self and not. Um, but the problem, I think the relativity is we've all been trained to look back from, the, um, from a position that, that tries to extricate these images from their function. I mean, it was the whole point of Soviet restoration. It was to get rid of function and leave the image as an aesthetic object. And that's why the, the 19th century ones are so difficult because they continue to do <laughs> what, had be, what had been done in the past, but they're also attached to the horrible, you know, imperial state. So they're doubly implicated in um, the, their, the sort of aesthetic of them is also like an indictment of their purpose, which is anathema to the early Soviet way of looking at them. I don't know that that made much sense, but I, you're, everything about what you say is incredibly important and true. Yeah, and especially if we take um, uh, the path of the uh, nowadays restorations of the churches, you see, they are, um, they are not museums or they are not just the item of the past for the mm -hmm. tourists. They are re living and breathing institutions of the faith. Yep. And that's why it is um, whatever deconstruction they performed towards the authentic past is justified from the point of view of the contemporary uh, post-Soviet uh, religion uh, uh, geared mentality. So that's yep. that's it. No, that's if I had if I had indulged myself and had time. As I was looking around Yandex and looking looking for examples of things, there were moments where I couldn't tell the difference between contemporary um, fresco church interiors and 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 nineteenth century ones. There, the the sense of um, back to the back to the past is so intense with the rebuilding and the redecorating of churches now. There, are, so uh, Biela, Filimonov would have been thrilled that he would now if he could see the churches which are being built now and frescoed that's a direct line of continuity back to Biela Ulsef. Yes. But also, you know, the interesting thing is that the relationship between authenticity and the restorers, you see, we do not know the original authors of the most of the icons. And in, in a sense, forgery of the icons is not the valid concept because you just, uh, it is not 
claimed as authorized originally. So you can do, as a matter of fact, you encourage to do as many forgeries as possible because the function's great. So that's uh, uh, the, the other interesting. Thank well, anyway. You. Thank you, Lita. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Great. Uh, so we have a question from Nikolaus Christidis. And let me go ahead and unmute you. Thank you. Um, uh, when Wendy talks, I think it's at, um, it's a danger for us, the rest of us, to talk about these things. But I will do it anyway because she knows so much and she um, explains so well everything. What I struck me from her talk uh, today, as well as in previous talks, is how much what she's talking about is connected to power. To political power. Mm -hmm. It looks like it comes from above. And what it strikes me as well, um, or what strikes me in this whole thing, is how many parallels there are to other 19th century European efforts at restoration. Mm -hmm. For example, look at Greece and the classical marbles that were full of color, but they were restored to their original whiteness, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and so I'm wondering here if we can have some form of comparative um, kind of thinking that both takes the power right uh, into consideration, the actual scenarios of power, right, in its case, mm -hmm. um, but also um, the extent to which they are, um, in fact, constrained by specific limits that power imposes. In other words, Sonchev, is Sonchev working, and that's my real question, is Sonchev working with very clear guidelines? You have to do this, you have to do that, um, you have to do the other thing, are they, or the Belarusov brothers, and so on. And as Wendy knows, I actually consult her with that, Alexei Afanasyevich Dmitriovsky, when he wanted um, to sort of control the icons that pilgrims bought in Jerusalem in the beginning of the 20th century, he said, let's get our artists in Palach to basically create them. Then we take them to Jerusalem and we sell them to the pilgrims from the Russian empire to bring back to the Russian empire. That's the question that I have. Thank you so much. Sorry for the time that I took. No, I love that idea. I could, I mean, it would be sort of horrifying, but wonderful to imagine a, a blockbuster show that brought all these efforts together. So you could really see it as a, as a, um, you know, as an histor a, a historic moment where there's a great need to do this. Oh, with Sonsif, I, I did find a reference that he, he sent Nicholas I 14 proposals for, for the interiors of the, of the Tiran Palace, and uh, he struck gold on the 15th. So oh, right. what, to, to your point of power, these czars are very hands-on with these projects. I was surprised to find that out. You know, they, they are they are personally invested in making sure that this is done right. Yeah. If it's, I it's may personal. add something here, I'm sorry. Go, go ahead, Wendy. No, no, go, go. Uh, um, I would like to point out, and I'm not going to play here the very knowledgeable person on that, but you know how the what we call today Byzantine archaeology was started, right, in Greece. Basically, it was the private secretary of the Queen of Greece, Olga, the Russian princess. Okay, in the 1870s and 80s. That's how, that was the guy who started the whole thing. And I'm gonna leave it at that. Thank you. It, it just shows how much there is to be done. I mean, we, it's, it's a real archeological site, this moment where we're not really wanted, most of us have not wanted to touch it because there are issues of power and there are difficult things to deal with to get your mind around and not just dismiss them out of hand, but try and take them seriously. Thank you. Thank you, Nikos. Uh, we have a question from Marcus Levitt. Marcus, I'll uh, ask you to unmute. Oh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Well, first, Wendy, great to see you and great to hear your wonderful paper. Great to see you. Too. <laughs> <laughs> I found um, the connections between contemporary restoration um, and the 19th century extremely provocative and maybe a little disturbing. Mm -hmm. um, just about 
a little more than a year ago, I went to visit um, New Jerusalem Monastery outside of Moscow, and it's absolutely transformed into a kind of a Disneyland monastery, mm -hmm. yes. um, completely redone, whitewashed, rebuilt. And um, at the entrance, there's this beautiful czarist kind of a gate, like in front of the hermitage, but on the top, a double-headed eagle in gold, which to me was a little bit dis also disturbing, again, because of this connection between state and church. Um, so I guess, uh, it, I guess it's both a question and a desire to know more about the contemporary um, adoption of the kind of strategy or the kind of cultural f formation that you talked about in your talk. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Um, and I'm, I'm, I know as I'm, this is all pretty new to me. I haven't looked into it. I, I know there are other people here that probably have a much better um, handle on it. But what I, going back to Lita's point also, I think what's happening here, which is, which is we're disturbed because we're living in another mindset we're not, most of us coming out of an academic secular background are not prepared for an attitude towards heritage, which has now been subsumed back into active functional life. Yeah. So when they take these, these, these historic spaces, which had been museums, or these historic objects, which had been in the Tretyakov gallery icons, and they put them back into functional life again, they need to be constantly upgraded and cleaned. Yeah, and you know, and they need to have new layers put on them. So as soon as they go back into life again, they're going to get damaged and they need to be restored. And that's the life of the functioning devotional object. And there's nothing, I won't say there's nothing to be done about it, but that's much more like all the, all the religious cultures of the world that allow objects to be continually living things. They don't stop them living so that they remain true to their aesthetic selves. And that, I think that's an insoluble, that's what the church and the museum is trying to handle in Russia today. It seems very difficult for them to find a meeting place on that. Uh, if I, the museum in Clinton, you know, they try the uh, uh, Russian Icon Museum in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. States, you know, they tried to combine the museum approach and the church approach to the, um, icons they uh, demonstrate, they uh, exhibit. Mm -hmm. And to, to, in a, to a certain point, they succeeded in this. You know, this is one of the rare examples. Mm. They'll be pleased to hear that. Isn't yeah. it? That's yeah. very nice. Yeah. Okay, and we have a question from um, Alconeer. Um, how did, uh, Elizabeth, would you like me to I'll go ahead and then unmute you if you'd like to ask a question aloud. Great. Oh, you're not unmuted. Okay, now you're unmuted. Hi. 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 Yes. Hey. Thank you so much. Absolutely fascinating. Good to see you nice and hear you. you even more. Listen, mm -hmm. what did Stasov, who had something to say about everything and very vocal and very self assured and so on, what? What did he have to say? How did he react to the restoration? I, I think he hated it. I, I th <laughs> like many people. In fact, this I didn't I didn't make this clear. I forgot to say this, but um, Philem Philemonov was up against a real resistance to this idea because it was considered sort of widely considered to be backsliding. You know, should, shouldn't we be putting our best foot forward and showing them what we can do and becoming more sophisticated and modern? And instead you're pulling us back into the past with these peasant, you know, Kustar painters. So it was really controversial. Most people, um, you know, violently disagreed, but because the Tsar, it was the Tsar's prerogative, um, he, he held sway. But I think Stasov was among those, which is odd actually, because you, you, you might think that he was, all for the peasant, you know, the peasant maker rather than the academic maker. Um, I have to investigate that, Elizabeth, to see if I can find out more. It's a good point. Okay, hear from you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, and we have a question from Andrew Fedosov. 
What is the measure of folklore versus ecclesiastic aesthetic? The Festered Palace mixes the two with religious aesthetic well ahead. Gosh, that's interesting to think about it as folklore. Um, are you thinking uh, of um, like fo folk art, like a vernacular idea rather than like folkloric? I mean, I'm thinking that's what you might. I think he's left the asking. meeting. Oh, okay. We can't ask okay. him, but. Okay, no worries. Um, well, I think this is the, that sort of crossroads there of Pariq being considered to be the home of the Narod. You know, this is, this is where the, the, the native traditions have survived. But actually, um, Andy Jenks, if you know his book, Russia in a Box, about the, the history of the Pariq box industry, which is goes, he actually straddles this imperial into the Soviet period. And his, his research into party, because actually they were very sophisticated operators and they were not just simple peasants at all. They were businessmen, they were educated. They knew what they were doing in their, in their um, interactions with these scholars from the, from the city. And, uh, and they were, the thing that made party such an amazing business um, operation is that they had, they could work in a range of styles. So they catered to the market, like Nikos is saying with the, the pilgrim market, you want this kind of icon, I'll give it to you. You want a, an academic icon, we can give you those too. So they worked in multiple styles, multiple languages. And it's the, it's actually the, the village of Mistyora. That's, that's where the idea of a, a more grounded, unchanging traditional icon resides there. And you've also got the difference between um, old believer folk, old believer icons and orthodox icons. And Palyuk was sort of a unimpeachable because it wasn't an old believer, I believe, I mean, um, community. And so it didn't come up against the problems of the orthodox church and its requirements. And, um... I have a question from Nikita Balagurov. Nikita, I'll go ahead and ask you to unmute. Hi, hello. Can you hear hey, me? Hey, Nikita. Hey. Hey, so nice to see you. See and you. thanks for a fascinating lecture. Um, I have a question about um, the uh, possible uh, uh, possible comments that the visitors of these uh, uh, reconstructed sites uh, you might ca came across. I'm asking because uh, there is one article by uh, a scholar from, uh, I think, from St. Petersburg now, uh, Kuprianov, who wrote an article based on the uh, comments book, uh, which the visitors of the uh, Palata Bayar Ramanovich oh, left after the after their visits. And uh, one of the main arguments of his article is that actually, uh, whilst the purpose of the museum uh, is actually to absorb the visitor into the world, which is supposed to be the, the, uh, the world that uh, has to be related to the contemporary Russian, uh, right, to the, uh, uh, to the native history. Uh, so he argues that based on these, uh, on his analysis of these uh, uh, welcome books, uh, those exposition, they actually sort of alienate this past from contemporary visitor, because as you, you use the word um, uh, that they were, uh, exotic, right, mm -hmm. in, in, the, in their appearance. So mm -hmm. I wondered to what extent uh, the 19th century visitors felt this sense of exoticism uh, rather than feeling the, you know, uh, the relation to the past, the, this uh, nativeness. Thank you. Oh, that's a fantastic question. And I mean, this is so much to be done because without, without that kind of material, how do we know? We don't even know to ask that question. The, the blind spots about not asking that question, well, this, this is what they did, but how did people feel about it? But that makes perfect sense because um, this, te this tension, which is part of the 19th century trying to get its native past back, the tension is that for an educated Russian audience, they don't really want anything to do with it. 
you know, it's gone for them. And so the artifice of bringing it back again, it's an enforced, enforced reacquaintance really, isn't it? With a past that's gone and no one thought it was gonna come back. So, to th and these are, I mean, these are museum spaces really. So they're turned, they're mu their museum displays like dioramas. They've got that quality of walking into a, a, a what do you call them? Like at the Met, those, um, the historic rooms. The idea of the museum where you you put someone back in that, but it's it's got a sort of a fun, not a fun fear, but it's a, you know, you're in there for five minutes and, and then you walk out again. So it can't possibly be native anymore. That, that's a really wonderful perspective. I'd, I'd like to know about that article, please, if I could. Thank you. Okay, and we have a question from John Vandevert. Um, talking about the reconvening with Russian cultural heritage and dispelling westernized secularism, I'm curious on how this sacred focus was maintained during the rise of early Sovietism. Was this reflected in perhaps ambivalence to restoration-based integrity of sacred paintings? This isn't exactly accurate, but it's fine. Um, well, oh gosh, a great question. Um, my impression is that they just ignored it. <laughs> in the early Soviet period. I mean, it's there, but not much you can do about it. So just let's talk about how golden and how great it is. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the lack of interest in sort of reading, except for a few things like here's the Rurik's and here's Vladimir and here's this, mm. here's this subject and here's that. Like going into any church in the Soviet period, going into Annunciation Cathedral, what are you going to do? So, right, you know, this right. is sort of a treated as history, I think. The reason I uh, asked was, uh, so I am a, do, I am a musicologist, so I, I do work in, in Soviet and post-Soviet music, and so I was asking, um, just, just in relation to Boris Kudinov, all these historical operas that use these backdrops uh, that correlated with these ar architectural uh, innovations. So I was curious then how, how this was maintained throughout the Soviet period, uh, because these historical operas use these sacred spaces as their backdrops uh, un unapologetically, even though there were campaigns to, to, to rid every facet of Soviet life of, of religious iconography. So I was just curious how it was being uh, uh, dealt with in the earlier kind of tumultuous periods. Gosh, that's, um, I'll tell you two examples. They're not the faceted chamber. I wanted to bring them in, but I, I thought it was being greedy. Um, two, two allied examples. So in, in 1950, 59, 60, they, the Boyer Palace was supposed, was, they were doing a capital remont. And the, the question came up about whether Richter's um, restorations were worse. I mean, this is not quite the same, but I'll see if it'll work. Um, were scientific enough or whether, whether they should be destroyed um, mm. because all that Romanov material, even though they're not figurative, they're tied up to this sort of imperial past. And they, um, there was a big conversation over, over sort of these restoration questions. And in the end, they, just, they, they papered them over. Hmm. And I don't know how long that was for, but they, they found a way of sort of protecting them underneath this layer of paper to take the eyesore away. So, um, and the other, the other example, um, these same Palyak uh, painters were brought in in 18, 1881 to paint some of the halls in the history museum next door and the Novgorod museum uh, is it the Novgorod yeah the Novgorod room if you go in it's painted blue and in the in the vaults above there are scenes of icons I mean they've painted great big icons in the on the walls at the top and in the I don't know when this was in the Soviet period but um they papered those over too they painted them over oh, so that's it that's an example of, you know, well, that's, but maybe because that's in a, in a sort of a secular museum space, they felt they could, but so there are places where the sensitivity, you can see it. And mm. a, there's something about the faceted chamber that it never sort of, it, it's like a ring, a ring of forgetfulness or an agreement not to be upset by it. And I think mm. the same with Boris Godunov because it's turned into historical backdrop mm. and it's religious function somehow drops away. I think that's how they much. deal with it. They historicize it. Mm, thank you very much. That's yeah, thank fascinating. You. Thank you. And we have a question from Joseph Bradley. Joseph, I'll go ahead and ask you to unmute. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, hi, Brad. <laughs> Wendy, thanks for a wonderful talk, stimulating as always. Okay. 
Uh, looking at the screen of the, uh, the um, coronation of Alexander III and looking at some of the text that you had, it made me think of some of the conservative ideologues, late 19th century, early 20th century that I've been reading. Um, and whether they're monarchists or populists or um, imperialists, statists, they have an overriding theme and that is make Russia great again. <laughs> and the way to make Russia great again is to go back, mm -hmm. go back to that Uvarov triad of orthodoxy, autocracy, nationality. But I think there's one sort of specificity of that coronation. We shouldn't forget that uh, Alexander III's father had just been assassinated. Mm -hmm. And so there was more than just rhetoric there about corrupt Europe and, and, and Russia's great because it's preserved orthodoxy and so on. There really was a, a fear of the kind of materialist philosophies emanating from Russian and, and from Europe. And this is where, this is where it leads to. Um, and I have a very small question about the, the, the Romanov palace. Maybe I'm getting my palaces mixed up, but wasn't this the palace uh, just outside the Kremlin that was almost destroyed when they built the Russia, uh, Russia Hotel. Yeah, on Varvaka, I think. It right, was. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's a restoration that I suppose we can <laughs> we we can applaud because that almost was gone and didn't didn't saving it become a kind of um, environmentalist or grassroots grassroots victory, I suppose, in a way, in the in the sixties. Yeah, I, can, I, I haven't looked into that, but I vaguely just shows how much there is to look at that at that 60s was that sort of big, um, you know, attack on the church again where that came back. So the there's a new wave of of destruction of heritage. So I, I actually I vaguely remember that, that it, um, which, which is sort of typical of the whole period that we, we think we've saved it and we've made an argument for why it's worth saving and then and then we lose it and then we have to restore it we have to bring it back again so yeah that's a really good point and especially your point about the the urgency of that rest of that um you know the whole symbolic system of his coronation that makes a great deal of sense thank you jack uh and lounsbury you want to go ahead yes <clears throat> i mean i'm not an art historian so coming at this from the outside thinking about it um, as someone who loves the 19th century. Um, one of the things I loved about this talk is one of the things that I love about the 19th century, and that is precisely uh, how embarrassing the material is. And I loved how you started out with embarrassment. Um, and the historian Suzanne Marshland has a, a, wonderful, uh, a wonderful book article called Embarrassed by the 19th Century, which is about the sort of cringiness of 19th century positivism, isms in general, the sort of the can-do attitude, um, the belief in progress, the sense that you know we can do it better, and how it's it's very uncomfortable, it's uncool, it's hard to reconcile with everything that we believe. And I think it's so incredibly productive to kind of to try to come to terms with that like you're doing and not just kind of push it away and say, oh, that's really icky and I'm cool. I don't want to look at it. And we see the same thing in across all different fields. I mean, we see it like in translation practice, for example. I mean, you'd certainly see parallels in um, the way people thought about literary translation, um, what was acceptable practice and mm -hmm. practice. Um, it was really amazing to me, this, the, or it just sort of crystallized for me the way people thought about translation when you talked about how the 19th century believed that their superior taste could make the translation better than the original. Well, Google thought the same thing about translations. So and this is in the 1830s and 40s, so it completely makes sense. And I mostly I just wanted to thank you for that because precisely the embarrassment of all this is what I think makes it so it's a challenge to us. Um, and thank you for bringing that into focus um, uh, for me. Thank you. Well, and, and I thank you for bringing, um, because you had told me about, you had sent me Suzanne Martian's article and it somehow gave me permission to admit that I don't know what to do with the fact that I 
really can't stand these <laughs> lumpy figures. <laughs> Everything in me aesthetically revolts against them. I don't want to look at them, but I can't find that a reason not to think they're fascinating. You know, so my own aesthetic narrowness, which is what it is, has got in the way of finding them the truly fascinating and worthwhile thing it is. Right, it's like these, um, you know, I also think about the scholars, mostly women scholars, who've recovered a whole body of women's writing, sentimentalist French writing from the early 19th century, and the labor that they did in order to do that changed the entire French canon for the 19th century. But I can't imagine what torture they went through in order to do that. Mm -hmm stuff unreadable you know but, but <laughs> it changed everything yeah isn't that strange to be working on stuff that you don't want to have anything to do with right but it's a paradox <laughs> it as you know aesthetic object as well so mm -hmm. it's worthwhile labor and and i i think it it's, could be transformative so thank you pleasure <laughs> It's all, you can see also how it's, the whole thing is in conversation with the 20th century. I mean, the 19th and the 20th are joined at the hip in a really complicated way. And the 20th century I mean, has taught all of us how to look at the 19th century. And it's pretty biased, both the Soviet experience and the modernist experience. Those two things together make looking at a lot of stuff really a problem. And we have a question from Christine Rowan. Christine, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Thank you. So thanks, Wendy, for, as always, a fascinating, stimulating talk. Um, and I had two sort of reactions. And one was how much of what you said echoed with the work that I did on fashion. Mm -hmm. And how how can we be Russian? What should we wear, right? And and they find that wearing the Muscovite robes just really doesn't cut it in the twenty in the early twentieth century. And mm -hmm. what are we going to do about this? But the the other thing that I found sort of striking was that every single one of the nineteenth century monarchs that you talked about, it it struck me that it, it shows the insecurity of the dynasty. Mm -hmm. that they have to continually refer back to the past and establish, okay, so we're related to, you know, St. Vladimir and, you know, and, and, and given what's going on in Russia, that would also make sense that this is a regime that is under attack, literally, by its people. And how are we going to... Um, how are we going to sort of delegitimate what it is that they're talking about? Mm -hmm. And this was one of the ways in which they could do it, precisely for the reasons that Richard Wortman talks about, these scenarios of power, right? Exactly. This is who we are, you know? Mm -hmm. Be careful if you try to come and get us. Um, so that's just my sort of thoughts about it. What do you do you think that that's a valid way of seeing it as a kind of attempt to legitimize the, the dynasty? Oh, I think completely. Um, I mean, the idea of insecurity, it's, it's, it's really tempting to sort of psychologize the whole thing. Mm -hmm. you know, that, I mean, I think, oh, sense of loss. What have we lost? And we're putting back what we've lost. But there is, um, and as if there's a psychological um, possibility in the 19th century that maybe we think is not there earlier, but maybe it was there of um, the self-consciousness of rest restoration. Mm -hmm. You know, the... the, the um, yeah, that, that mainly. Yeah, but it's also political. You know, we yeah. want to be in power, right? So yeah. it's, it's, I think it, that's at play too. So, yeah. but thank you so much. This was great. Thank you, Chris. I just wanted to mention a fantastic um, talk I heard at the Russian History Museum, by Russ Martin. He mm -hmm. gave a talk about the bride shows and mm -hmm. he was talking about how um, the Romanovs really cleverly um, when they, when they had to institute their own laws for the bride shows, they adopted all of the, all of the rituals of their pre the previous dynasty, but they upped them and made them even more traditional and more steeped in the past than they had been. So much did they want to um, emphasize their right to follow their, their dynasty to be invested in the formal one. So there's a lot of this rolling over 
of you know of generations and layers of who are deliberately doing what you're saying for their own purposes legitimate themselves or strengthen their power or whatever yeah okay thanks That's great thank you chris and we have a question from Sergei Bogatidov. Um, it is interesting that the faceted chamber, which was built by an Italian architect, was originally a showpiece of Western secular architecture. And how did later nationalist projects interpret the Western origin of the chamber? Oh, that's a, that's a biggie and a goodie that I don't know very much about. I was. Um, I think it's one of those things that by the time we're looking at is folded into the, the, the historical legacy as, as um, something completely, actually um, an object of pride. I, my feeling is that it, it, the fact that Ivan III was in a position of power that he could bring in Italian architects. It's a, it's a they're coming to me, not us going to them. So I think it's a, sort of a, a way of reading that historical moment of power. That's how powerful we were. We could bring in Italians to build, to design our buildings for us. So that's, that's my understanding of the, how, that's, how that plays out. Okay, and let's see. Um, Olga Mayorova, I'm going to go ahead and ask you to unmute because you have your hand raised. Yes, thank you very much. Um, a wonderful talk. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Um, I have a question. Um, how do you think the restoration projects under Nicholas I differ from the similar projects under Alexander III? And I'm asking because Richard Wortman showed the profound differences between uh, these two rulers and these two scenarios of power. So, um, and they are completely different um, vision of the heritage that they are um, and the periods that they wanted to restore. So um, uh, since your talk was more about the continuity of, the, of such efforts rather than about um, the differences between different rulers, that's why I'm asking. And I'm sorry, I can, I, I'm not turning my um, camera on for the quality of connection reasons. Thank you. That's okay, thank, thank you, Olga. Um, I don't know very much about this, but I, the main thing I would comment that comes to mind is um, Nicholas's involvement in Kiev. I think that's where the, one, of the, one of the lasting um, stains really of his, of his um, inadvertent destructive use of restoration is the work that was done down in, in um, St. Sophia's in, in Kiev. And there's Sonsev was to blame for that. They discovered, you know, underneath the whitewash of the 18th, the plaster actually, they discovered a vast amount of the, of the original 12th century paintings left. And they brought Sonsev down to bring them back to life again. And there was an enormous amount of destruction done as a result, sort of well-intentioned, no doubt, but they really got on it and they did a lot of damage down there. So I, I um, I don't, I don't really know quite how to handle, how to answer your question in an intelligent way, because I don't know, I don't know enough about it, but it's a really good angle to take, like would be to compare. The, the, a, a really useful book that you, if you're not familiar with it, is Gerald Zdorniff's book on the rediscovery and the restoration of painting in the 19th century. It was translated a couple of years ago. Um, and it's an excellent survey of all of these stages in the history of Russian restoration. Um, it's really a, then you'll, there you'll find some pretty unforgiving descriptions of what happened under Nicholas and, and under Alexander in the, in the 19th century. It's pretty grim reading actually, which makes me feel awful and even more embarrassed about finding interest in, in this period. Cause I know I'm supposed to loathe and detest them and condemn them. <laughs> 
Well, I, I love, I love, it. it's uh, it's the way for the 19th century to express themselves and their vision of the Narod. So uh, I, I really find it uh, valuable and maybe it's my bad taste, but I love it. I think, <laughs> thank I you think so much. Thank you. I think we're all about to start embracing our bad taste, which is a slippery slope to go on. <laughs> right. Be encouraging it. <laughs> And we have a question from Alison Hilton. I'll go ahead and ask you to unmute. Alison, you're not you're you're still muted. Sorry. Thank you. Um, thank you, Wendy, and apologies for my lateness. I made a time zone so reckoning wrong. Mm -hmm. Um this goes back to a very early comment. Somebody mentioned folkloric elements not folk art, but folkloric. Mm -hmm. And I've been thinking about that, uh, especially with so many of the comments having to do with insecurity and bad taste and so forth. And it seems to me that um, Russia had a legend about its origins, of course, um, that's in the faceted chamber and Russian um, sense of self was very much built on uh, real and fake folkloric legends. But it, that whole idea of going back to real sources based on not, not peasants, but the forerunners of the peasants, the original Slavs and so forth, mm -hmm. that gave a very good excuse for people to have whatever approach they wanted to the subject of restoration. Um, it would be genuine if it was connected with folkloric origins and rituals. Somebody earlier mentioned um, rituals, bride displays. Uh, any, any excuse uh, that was away from politics and really away from Orthodox religion could be very handy in the Soviet period. It, this is just a thought that has occurred to me on the basis of these discussions, but I wonder if it's useful at all. I think it's very useful because it shows the coming together of, um, I mean, I think in some ways this is also part of the Soviet investment in tourism as, mm -hmm. a, mm -hmm. as a, a way of explaining how we handle our past because part of the, the lack of box industry is the, the, the supreme way of getting around this unfortunate icon background. And so this, that, that's a very interesting analogy that I don't know that they actually say it, but even, even the way I was looking at all the postcard, Soviet postcard sets you could get of the faceted chamber from the Soviet period on eBay, um, of which there are many, and they've got, they've, they've got a weird sort of look as, as if they're like little lacquer boxes because they're, when they take the little close-ups of the scenes, I mean, they might as well be a lacquer box in some, they're gold, they're glitzy. <laughs> so they're like little, chocolates of little candies of a certain palatable way of looking at it. And that's really interesting, Alison. Thank you. Okay. Um, it looks like we have a hand up from uh, Sergei Magatheri, if I can go ahead and unmute you. Okay, can you hear me now? Um, thank you very much uh, for your talk. I think I slightly misstated uh, my question because my question was not about Muscovy, but actually about the 19th century. And uh, my understanding is that nationalism is actually a very cosmopolitan phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And I think Olga Mayorov's point about different scenarios of power, or Richard Wortman's point, uh, is very important because Nicholas I's nationalism uh, was in fact very much in line with uh, Gothic revival style. I'm just looking at a picture of the Westminster Palace now, which is arguably as ugly as the facet chamber from certain perspective. Uh, <laughs> Alexander III was different. He was a bit weird. So I think we need to be very discriminating first uh, when it comes to different uh, emperors 
Russian emperors in the 19th century. And also, I think we need to be cautious about assuming that there is something special or unique uh, with uh, the way 19th century Russians treated their past, because I think it's actually a pan-European phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And Thank this came, you. someone brought this up earlier. I absolutely agree. I'm not, I'm not trying to say this is unique to Russia, just trying to follow a tra trajectory um, back to a point, but, but yes, for sure, it's all, it's all over the place. It was Nikos that was saying this. Um, uh, and I think I can see here why this is such a, um, a, a meeting point, like all topics, it's a place where people in different disciplines are going to find different perspectives. So for me, I was, trying to understand this as from the perspective of restoration, like when you've got a blank slate, the, to, to me, those three imperial projects are united because they're each taking an, a secular historical space, which has been gutted and putting their own stamp on it as a, as a continuum. But, but within that continuum, I can imagine, as you say, Sergei, that, that each of them is coming at it for very different purposes. Um, so I think they're not, not mutually exclusive that those things come together, all of them, all three things. Well, thank you very much. And also one, one brief question. Uh, should we use the word the restoration in this context? Because, well, there is nothing to restore, strictly speaking. Well, it's an idea. <laughs> OK, <laughs> thank you. No, I've got, uh, very much got it in quotation marks there. This, this is why. You know, the actual, the language of restoration is also really the words, the words that are used within the Soviet context, they're all over the place. And that's why Graba wanted to draw a line in the sand and say, no, we're, we're doing raskritia. We're not doing anything that has to do with restoration because then the subjectivity of the restorer comes in. Yeah. Um, at least that's what he, that was what he was trying to say. I thought memory studies might be useful here because there is a lot of work on Oh, absolutely. Memory. Yeah. Oh, totally. This much. is inventing Thanks. tradition. This is, yeah, Eric Hobsworn, all that stuff. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think that was our last question. So unless we have anything else. Uh, oh, Elizabeth Falconer, let me ask you to unmute. You're, you're still muted. Just give it a moment. There we go. Yeah. Hi. I just want hi <laughs> again. Whether Violet Le Duc did his work before or after the restorations, or did his work either reflect or influence the process? No, I think they. I think it was more sort of like an endorsement um, idea. Mm -hmm. Like he was. He was there to. Philemon have used him to say we're going in the right direction. I think it was sort of like confirmation of his of his goals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but there was I'll just say this is another piece I had to chop, and I know I'm I'm getting it in at the last minute. But um, one of the things that really gave Philemon of hope was in 1867 he was the Russian commissar for the um, the Paris ex exposition of the history of labor. And he put together a huge um, section of Russian antiquities, including icons and copies of icons. And mm -hmm. when he was there, he met some of the people that came in were French, essentially um, national revivalists. Um, Paul Durand, a guy called Victor Perrin, and they were involved in repainting uh, French cathedrals and churches at the same time. Like Saint-Germain-des-Prés was being repainted Mm -hmm. right around that time. And when they came in and they saw the icons that um, Philemonov had on display and the prodigy, <coughs> they said, oh my gosh, that's just like our stuff. They recognized a common purist um, sort of Nazarene inspiration of kind of primitivism, a return to, 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 to native origins. Mm -hmm. So that goes back to the point that Sergei and Nikos made that it's, they recognize each other when they see it. They feel that they're that they're pursuing a similar goal, which actually is against the grain of the norm. It's, it's, it, it's against mainstream thinking. Yep. Thank you. Well, thank, 
Professor Solomon, Wendy, so much for this fascinating discussion. I think that we will all um, be meditating on it for a long time. And thank you to all who contributed to the discussion too. It was really wonderful. And we hope to see you again at the next 19V presentation and at other Jordan Center events. Wendy, I really can't thank you enough. It was absolutely fascinating. Thank you.